Oh, uh, here we go. This is Michael Anderley. I'm the only one who matters on this. You do not have to pay attention to the person who's walking across and looking around. <laughs> you kind of remind me of that Muppet. <laughs> Little eyeballs that go around and stuff. <laughs> So, so we left we left Michael hanging. We did That's the five right. second countdown, kind of maybe did. Uh, I'm coming to you live from 150 miles from the Arctic Circle. Rains have started the last few days, so it's cooled it off and uh, also helped relieve some of the uh, smoke and fire around the area. So uh, it's actually pretty pleasant outside, except for the fact that it's raining right now. So it's a little darker than normal. But here we are. That's right. Here we are. So from Las Vegas at this time. It is not raining. It is not 72. In fact, it's probably closer up to getting up to the 100, but it's definitely not as hot as I remember it last year. It could be I'm inside more often or yeah. gone. One of the two. Yeah, or gone. Yeah. Yeah, we're uh, we're down to 72 in the house. It's actually 61 outside. Oh, yeah. No, we're not even close. I'm yeah, down to 60 69 in the, in the house or in the condo with the air conditioner running full time. <laughs> And blasting. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We actually, we actually took an old uh, air conditioner we had in our garage that we shipped up from Pennsylvania, and finally the weather has defeated us. And I, uh, <clears throat> I had to jerry rig a cardboard uh, cutout for the window because it's made for a slide window, and we've got crank out because they're better for because uh, they seal tighter for uh, uh, the minus forty days when you don't want any breeze and cool coming in through your window. So we have triple pane windows that crank out and then crank in and snap down tight to, to seal them. So I had to jerry rig a cardboard thing to, for the vent for the portable air conditioner. And yeah, it's cranking right now. My wife is happily sleeping underneath like 12 blankets. <laughs> it's like 65 degrees in the, in the room. Your AC is going to go up to the four figures for the month. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Electrical. Holy cow. It's an electrical co-op. So, and we have a, we have some kind of a, a average for the year. So they just take the average and hit us. It, it's not going to be a big bump. <clears throat> All right, here we are. Here we are in today. And uh, I said something profound, and Michael's like, hey, profound. Lies, damn lies, and mistruths in the industry. That's right. So those things, and this isn't uh, this isn't a bitch fest. This is about, about shaping your attitude for what you need to do and what is doable for you, because this is a smorgasbord, and we'll caveat everything with probably, uh, with what can work for you. So uh, with that, Michael had some uh, uh, opinions and was talking about some stuff before we went live. And I'd like you to just review that again with the, with the listeners. All right. So one of the ones that I think uh, sets off a, a storm of controversy every single time, and I don't care. Let's just put it up this way, because I have what happened for me. And I know that and I understand and I can appreciate different opinions. But uh, the hashtag probably is definitely in here when people say you must have an editor. And I think really the statement is, is 20 books live? And if I had had been forced to have an editor, then 20 books would never have existed. I know my personality at that time when I wrote my first book and it would not have allowed me to work with an editor. I just, it wasn't going to happen. And so I edited my own books uh, poorly, completely admit that part. And what I want to kind of point out with this is we're not saying that in the process of creating and releasing a book, there are certain things you must do. You must attain a cover. Whether you use the Amazon cover creator, you go out and buy a pre-made, you actually get an artist to do one, it doesn't matter. But you'll realize that the cost is anywhere from zero to thousands of dollars to get a cover. The, the blurb itself, you have to put one in, whether it's high quality, low quality, it's going to sell you, it's not going to sell you. You're going to need a blurb because Amazon won't allow you to put a book on the website, neither will Apple, without a blurb. You're going to understand and need the, the <coughs> metadata for the book. And so, but when we come down to the editing, what we're saying is the book needs to have a review. We typically call it the editing step. We typically call those who uh, get paid to work that part for you editors. We're not suggesting that you don't need to do an editing step. What I am telling people, and I will argue with them about this, is it does not have to be a editor. You could be having proofreaders, you could be having JIT readers, you could be having fans, you could be having your uh, English teacher who now is retired and is willing to do it. It could be you if, if you're so uh, qualified to do it. I'm not. 
as evidenced by my first book. But <laughs> it can be professionals, but here's the gotcha. I didn't realize at the time because I got really confused. What's a proofreader? What's a line editor? What's a developmental editor? What are all of these different names mean? And so uh, from that standpoint, you can put out a better quality book with the right editor. You can put out a better selling book, perhaps, with the right editor. But the reality is I've seen just as many bad editors, people who call themselves editors, people who uh, were basically lying or they were bad or they were new or they changed your voice or they thought they understood how to write and they didn't. You have just as much a chance from what I've seen so far as shooting yourself in the foot by grabbing an editor that doesn't match with you than you do doing it yourself. And so for people who would like to uh, prescript that you have to have an editor, I've got a million reasons that says, no, you don't. So we can have a discussion on what goes, but what we won't ever disagree on is that you need the step of making sure that you're putting out the best quality book that you can, the best quality story that you can at the time. And if you listen to say Kevin Tomlinson's recent podcasts, he explains his own opinion on this. And he also is very similar to this. There's a book out that says how to edit your own book. You know, I'll tell you right now, I'm not a good editor. I'm not a good proofreader. I don't see a lot of stuff. We can use Grammarly. We can use some of the other software products to make it better. And I did, but I'm not a professional editor. And I recognize that. That's why LMBPN has a whole team. Lynn Stigler heads up her own group. We have the ability to do 2 million edited words a month because we do believe that that role needs to be there. And why don't you hire those you can, but what if you can't? And that's where I say LMBPN and everything we had right now would not exist if there was a rule and a role or a, a declaration that I had to have an, an editor. Your turn. Same with me. My first book, I, I edited it myself. I looked for an editor and could not find one. Uh, not one that was uh, realistic. Uh, we're both of the same mind. Uh, I, I, I want my book edited and uh, somebody tells me, well, I can do it next year, like yeah. 12 months from now next year. And that, that's not going to happen. Sorry, because I, I understand how uh, work for hire goes. If you're mm -hmm. an independent contractor, you want to put in enough, uh, you want to fill those gaps, but you may get ahead, you may get behind, you you have uh, you can have work to fill voids, you have people fall out. And, and that's, as I've been in this business for a while now, I see that, that, yeah, people miss their deadlines all the damn time. So if you're an editor, somebody misses their deadline, sorry, man, you're moving down in the queue, unless you have people on retainer or, or working and they just work your next book in, however it works, but that's, but that's step. I never did it, and that was the book I sold to TradPub exactly as it was, non-edited. I edited it, and it was a long book, 100,000 words. I read it at least 20 times, so I was tired. I don't ever want to read another word from that book again because I, I read it enough, <clears throat> and I still missed a lot of stuff. So I always need to have an editor, and uh, this is a, a copy editor is what I really need. I have four, uh, my insider team, they're my developmental editing team because they read in process to make sure that I'm hitting the right tropes that I'm not going off track, that I'm not dragging the story down with a bunch of backstory and stuff like that. So I, that step, I uh, am a firm believer <clears throat> of that step and that I am not the best person to do that step. I write the story and other people help me polish it. So, uh, cause I, I really don't like, uh, uh, putting out the final product and having a typo or three or, or more. Uh, I'm okay with one or two and I will fix them the instant I hear of them. And, uh, uh, but that's uh, one or two. That's the most, that's absolutely the most that, uh, that I ever want to see in any of my books. And I go through a lot of processes thanks to the infrastructure that Michael built uh, to, to clean that up and make sure that I put out the best quality product that I can. So the mistruths. Uh, one thing we were talking about uh, uh, before as well, and this also resulted in us kicking a bunch of people out of 20 books, was a, is there a line space in between paragraphs? Okay, I, I publish with LMBPN, and we we publish them in that sometimes they have a line space, sometimes they don't, even though we use the same template within Vellum, so I don't I don't freaking know. I don't know if it's uh, user selectable in uh, your Kindle. Yeah, but, in uh, general, yeah, we, we don't. I mean, I talked to Steve, so mm -hmm. once we moved to Vellum, 
Mm -hmm. those didn't exist. I certainly yeah. put them in the beginning uh, yeah. three and a half years ago because I just freaking liked them. <laughs> yeah. I, and that's, I like reading with a space in between and I do the indent for the paragraphs as well. Uh, so an indent and like half of a line space in between mm -hmm. the paragraphs, just because I like that breakup for me. Now I've seen people who blow their text up to like 12 words on a, on a full Kindle screen. And so them, any extra line spacing is just huge waste of space. But, but for me, on my on my Kindle Paperwhite, I like that space. I like the indent. It's just just what I like, and I've never had a reader tell me, "Well, I'm not reading your book because you you put a line space in between your paragraph." Oh my, for Christ's sake! If you can't hook them in that first paragraph and keep them reading, they're they're going to nitpick that. Well, then that's not my reader. Uh, you can go find a technically perfect book and then go enjoy that. Uh, technique in your mind, and this is one thing we're talking about. Technically perfect is a relative standard. Very subjective. Very subjective. You know, we can there are certain rules and things that uh, we have to do. Paragraphs, quotation marks, um, commas appropriate, not appropriate. Even then, we we move the comma expectation. You know, we are we um, we're all fiction. We're not nonfiction. We are not nonfiction. Almost seemed like a double negative. You know, but we we do things for the for what I perceive the reader is a great uh, experience and. To what you just said a minute ago, Craig, some readers don't like that experience. Okay, but guess what? I'd rather have a buffet of uh, food that has been spiced so that you either like it or you don't, but it's not blah. I'm okay with that. And, you know, and that's where I think some people get um, a little tied up is they believe, okay, you should be always making it work for me. No, I don't. I'm pretty sure that that's not how business works. <laughs> yeah. So we do try to hit the the market that we're trying to go for. Sometimes we miss it horribly. I get that, in which case that's on us. But if we're talking about something that is a best-selling series and we have a few people that aren't that doesn't fit for them, okay, uh, maybe we'll get another series that'll fit for them. Great. But this is the series that we have for this. So, uh, you know, just it, it goes back and it goes forward. And I think that... Um, individuals, I, I really honestly, I think you and I tried to talk about it yesterday when things were blowing up. It's like, what drives the person to really see that or to feel that or yeah. to say it? The only one that I remember back in 2015 is people going, well, if you go, if you put out something without being edited from an editor, the, the presumption I made from the way that they wrote was with a quote unquote professional editor was that you're then going to bring down indies. You're going to bring down all indies and specifically them. Well, I think that's a bit much because more than likely we don't even share the same um, readers. And I can guarantee you that uh, Kirthier and Gambit brought in more readers into, into Kindle Unlimited, even with all of our beginning efforts, because I have readers saying I was about to quit and I got a hold of your series. And now I'm strictly in Kindle Unlimited because of your series. So guess what? It goes the opposite direction as well. <clears throat> My yeah. not awesomely edited stuff kept people in Kindle Unlimited. So what it says is that as a better, as a story that reached the people with the type of um, characters and everything else that they wanted, that they wanted to be a part of was more important than a quote unquote professional editor. Story trumped. Now, story trumped with great proofreading trumps even that. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, we can't say it. And if you have a, a lackluster story, then your editing probably should be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I posted this morning, I, a couple people uh, instantly I was irked because uh, this uh, uh, perception that that too many indies publish bad books. And I, I, I the readers, the readers are the only arbiter. And I, I as somebody else commented saying, I, I don't think your average reader can tell the difference between an indie book and a, and a traditionally published book, not anymore. And uh, so giving all indies a bad name, I, I don't know how that's possible when uh, I, just dropped my, red. I just dropped my spoon on the floor, man. I, I was playing with it and it, it fell on, on the floor <laughs> where the dog picks. Where, um, where, where the, the dog's going to choke on it. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I, needed to get my, I needed to get my spoon off the floor. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> The, the readers probably can't tell. 
So they're not going to look at a book and say, hey, I don't like this book. Oh, my God, a typo. Gee, I'm out of here. They're not going to go back through and say, aha, all indies and paint. No, they're just going to say that guy. And then that's yeah. probably not your reader anyway if they let something like a, a typo. Now, if there's a typo every page and something that really pulls them out of the story, uh, uh, changing changing anything. If you're using double quotes for uh, for uh, uh, dialogue at the beginning and you switch to single quotes for some reason, I know my, my software, Word does that on me on occasion. They use a single one instead of a double quote. And uh, so if you do that now, that that's that's a miscue. It's easily fixable, but it'll also help uh, maybe take the reader out of the story. And you don't ever want to take your reader out of the story if you don't have to. So you do the best you can with what you have. So that's why we have a, a, a pretty, pretty healthy team of, of folks to review. But it's still if they're into the story, like you have a. a uh, death becomes her and you're halfway through you're not going to put that book down halfway through <clears throat> just because of all the tendrils and everything that's hanging the uh, 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 the storylines that are that are leading you on that you have to find out what's going to happen you're not going to put that book down even with a, a miscue of an edit a missing period at the end of a sentence people don't care but if you if you add that stuff in and make sure that you have that as well as the great story then then you have the double win so what you have to do is find a reader willing to pay for your book, and it has to be a it has to be a good story told in a great way. And if it's a great story told in a great way, then then you win. And mm -hmm. uh, and then finding the readers, it's easier to find readers for a great story than be a marketing guru on a piece of crap that and certified not not you saying, well, I think this is crap, and it turns out to be a bestseller and, and millions of five star reviews. No, <laughs> it's it's. The re no reader likes your book because it's so bad. It's it's not engaging. The characters don't relate. Whatever it might be, or you targeted to the wrong audience. Uh, like uh, if I tried to target my military sci-fi to the romance audience, I would get slaughtered uh, appropriately. So, so oh, but come on, finding let's do that. finding those readers <laughs> willing to pay for your work, which means you're you're aligned. You've hit what their expectations are. So the mistruths like uh, font. Some people are really wrapped around the axle about the font. Oh, it has to be Garamond. It has to be Helvetic. It has to be Arial. That's all selectable in Kindle. They'll change it. So on an ebook, font is almost completely irrelevant unless you buy a font and when you try to upload it, it doesn't recognize it or your so Mobi how, goes wacky. So if someone went by a small hole in the wall restaurant and they go in there and they have a horrible experience, are they swearing off restaurants for the rest of their life? Yeah, yeah. Now, so the next question is when we sh when we see and the, and the the people talk about the fact that it's like it's so hard to hit in the top hundred. Do they ever say it's so hard to hit in the top hundred because all these other books are crap? No, they say because all the other books have high quality, great covers, good editing. They're not taking people out of the story. That's what's in all in the top, and we're not talking the top three. We're talking the top thousand, and that's yeah. not just thousand in the store. That's typically thousand in the larger group sci-fi fantasy. So, and most of those are in Kindle. If you look at any of the statistics, whether we go through Kalytics or anyone else, they're going to tell you this is what's there. Is there crap coming into the store? Of course. Is it red? No. <laughs> so, yeah. when you're looking at it, it's like who's who is it going to hurt? It's going to hurt the author because we're past that stuff in the in, that happened in the last few years. If you're going to compete, you need to have a well edited, proofread, perhaps is the correct word, copy edited story. And that's it. That's all we're saying. But it doesn't have to be an editor because yeah. don't get me on this rant about the quality of people who call themselves editors. Yeah. There's yeah, no have, uh, story. That's freaking horrible, horrible editors who tried to change voice. And, and I mean, not the voice of here's my poorly written paragraph, but just change yeah. my voice completely, change a, a, a uh, active to passive, passive to active, and uh, and changing. Oh, hey, this needs to be present tense. Hey, go away. Uh, I've had some really bad ones. And somebody brought up a, a point, uh, JRM, whoever you are. Uh, all true. It's not just about typos. And when I talked about consistency, it's the grammar flows, of course, and uh, uh, plot holes. Another thing. That's where mm -hmm. that's where my beta readers, and as mm -hmm. a developmental editor, those are. The, it could even be the proofreader. They're like, hey, I got lost in this section, even though they're looking for typos. They'll still. It, the good ones will tell you, hey, I got lost here. And then because don't ask a proofreader to fix your shit. Uh, you are in the better position to fix your story. 
uh, they're great at identifying here's what's wrong, but but the the author is probably much better at identifying how to fix it, uh, how to make sure that flows. And I give the example of I had an AI, uh, artificial intelligence in an Android body, who for his dialogue tags was snarl, bark, uh, <laughs> groan, growl. And I'm like, holy shit, it was through the whole book. I mean, it was a co-author had done that and, and done a great job. But for some reason, he fixated on these dialogue tags. And I'm like, oh, my God, how do I fix? So right up front on the very first page, I put it right when he got his body, the AI said, I'm going to snarl, growl, and bark my dialogue and, or bark my words and see how the the crew Human. responds and leave and left it at that. So one sentence fixed probably 200 dialogue tags that I thought were weren't weren't <laughs> spot on, shall we say? Because I didn't see an AI as as growling or snarling or uh, even yeah. though it worked and it worked really really well by adding one sentence to the end at the right time. So that's a. Uh, uh, that is another thing like this. It, it, it was a, uh, a, a a miscue because an AI, you think more machine-like in how he approaches, like data, don't get excited. Here's uh, here's the data, here's what it is, here's uh, facts as I see them. So uh, there's different ways to fix those things, but you got to get that second set of eyes because when I read through it, I just saw it as a miscue and and uh, I'm like, Jesus, I, I, I can't fix all of these. I don't want to go through and fix hundreds of uh, of dialogue tags that aren't resonating in the right way. But in this case, you were the developmental editor. You were the one that was reviewing it. I, I was and, and content. And as the co-author, I, I added in a lot of words on different things. But still, it was a, uh, it was an opportunity to fix something without having to go through and, and detail and nitpick. And it worked. It actually worked better that way because it gave the AI a more human a more living being kind of persona because he was trying this to see if he would fit in better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was how the, the readers took it. But when I looked at it, I'm like, holy shit, why would an AI snarl? <laughs> but, but it's fixable. Yeah. So that's probably it on that one. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. just to sum yeah. it up, we agree that the role, that step needs to have uh, been done put out the best quality because if, if we're here about trying to sell your product, your product needs to be quality to the best of your ability yeah. of what you can do, what you can afford. And like I said, Kevin Tumlinson has a podcast the last couple of weeks that you can go back and take a look at. And um, he's got some ideas on that. So what, what about advertising? Somebody brought up a, an issue that uh, for some reason they, they uh, had heard that you don't advertise a book until the third one is out in the series. Um, well, I actually said something like that. I just said, for me at that time, as a whale reader, advertising to me when you had a first book wouldn't have been relevant because I would have clicked on your, your ad and I would have gone to it and said, oh, you don't have three books out? I'm not going to read it. I read fast. And what I found out is actually I read mediocre. <laughs> there are some people who put me to shame, but I wouldn't have been interested in it. So for myself, I didn't want to advertise until I had three books. A corollary to that is when you advertise with only one book, then you have a situation where you're potentially just going to be losing money acquiring fans because you, the, you're you not going to gain enough money. Let's say you get 100 clicks at 25 cents a click. It's $25. One book gets you $2.99, $3.99, $4.99, $3.50. If you use 70 cents, 70 percent at three, five bucks, you lost money. <laughs> but if you have a whole series behind you, you gain money. So you know, yeah. you, you have this, you know, back and forth. If you're down at like one sale every 11 clicks, all right, you know, then you're at three, two, let's see, 275 for your clicks. You've got a sale. If you covered it at 350, you're making 75 cents. Great. But that yeah. is a phenomenal click and purchase rate. Yeah, that's a great rate. That's a great rate. But that is, I will say, but once you have the credibility, if you're a new author and you have just one book out, the reader's my question, will will a second book be out, especially if it's the first in a series and you have no other books? <clears throat> you look at uh, Michael's page or my my uh, Amazon page, you see we have we have a lot of books out. So when I say, hey, this is the first in a three book series, readers can guarantee that they're going to get the next few books because uh, and I'll tell them here's the dates because I, I know exactly when I'm going to publish books two and books three in a series because I have them. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's the intentionality. And also, I have the credibility having published, what, 16 different series. Michael has uh, uh, 40 mm -hmm. or 50 different series. And each one, you guarantee you're getting the next books in the series. 
Yeah, we set up, uh, I was talking with the, with a person yesterday about a potential solution or a, a series. And I said, you know, what we do is we plan right now on sets of three, four sets of three. It used to be three sets of four. But, you know, first trilogy, second trilogy, third trilogy, fourth trilogy, where they're all basically consume an arc. But if we put out the first three and those three don't resonate and they're not selling to the best of our ability, or, or at least where we believe that we, they should, we close it up on three. So our arc structure already had that we could close it down on three. And if it keeps going, we go to six. So to your point of, you know, the next book, if people know what's going on internal at LMBPN, then they know that we've already planned three books. We yes. already planned six, nine, 12, but we'll stop them early and not leave them hanging. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll have a complete story arc, even though there's more room at mm -hmm. three or six, if the series isn't selling uh, uh, up to snuff. Because I know I've stopped a couple series early, even though we tried to wrap them. It's uh, that just wasn't enough uh, uh, reader interest. So mm -hmm. now somebody asked a question about free books. I mean, that's not a mistruth. It's just a, an advertising marketing. If you have only one book and you make it free, I would make it free on book funnel and get those email addresses and get the interest. Uh, if you put it on Amazon, uh, not Amazon, if you go wide and make it free everywhere and then and then say, hey, people, people will love me, uh, people will forget you. Even if they read the book and love it, they will forget you un uh, unless you can funnel them into your newsletter somehow so you can con contact them when book two is out. So I personally would never, if I have only one book out, give it away for free. I didn't give my first book away for free until after I already had 10 or 15 books out. Uh, because it's I want people to come and read my other stuff because if you have one book out and it's free you're going to make no money and you're going to be wondering why uh, people eh, I'm not making any money well no shit even if you change the price back to uh, uh, $2.99 $6.99 uh, whatever it doesn't matter because people have already gotten it for free <laughs> and you're free the people who download for free are not as uh, invested in your book so that's where you're going to get your your lesser quality reviews uh, almost all my all my, my one star reviews are one I kicked them out of uh, twenty books of fifty k or two they uh, uh, got it for free and it wasn't their flavor which if you're not pushing the boundaries of your your audience then you might get only five star reviews because hey this very narrow I I only target readers who I know are going to love my book well I want to find where where is that boundary and keep pushing and pushing. And when I start getting the one star reviews of holy shit, this is military sci fi, that stuff sucks. Okay, I might have pushed too far on trying to find readers. Uh, thank you for buying my book. Uh, I understand you're not going to buy any more. Uh, and then there's the readers who uh, 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 read every one of your books and give them all one stars. Oh, my God, more crap from this guy. Can't wait for the next one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you for buying my book. Um, yeah. The, when, uh, in the beginning of Carthian uh, Gambit, I had a few books out. And I was basically two ninety nine at that time. That's kind of the forty percent of the sales were two ninety nine for the most of the books. I decided to go down to ninety nine cents. It wasn't free, but it was ninety nine cents. I dropped a re my read through went from seventy five to sixty eight percent from book one to book two, and then my reviews started coming in really low. So while it's not free, it does go to the fact that people who don't uh, invest much don't appreciate much. Those that have to invest more will take more time and be more discerning about whether or not this book is something that meets them. You'll find if you do, if you study sales, the higher your price, the more people are going to feel like they need to, to be engaged. So um, an example of this is a long time ago in the uh, IT industry, I think it was Packard Bell or something, the uh, company had grabbed the name Packard Bell and they put out cheap product. It was just cheap computers. And they got a bunch of returns. And then uh, they were doing another effort of computers and they put them out and they were more expensive and the review and their returns dropped. It's not necessarily that the computers were any better or worse. It was the fact that the pricing caused people to be more discerning about what they wanted. And then once they made the decision, they seek, they sought reasons why they had made the right decision. So. That's it. That's it. It's a, it's a good, uh, good point. Uh, that's why. That's why the conferences. We're never going to make the conferences for free. We could get all mm -hmm. kinds of sponsors now for what we are, but uh, people need to have a buy. Even if it's a hundred bucks, you still need to be able to invest in yourself and say, "I invested in myself." Yeah. Uh, uh, what about a reader magnet? I, I thought I uh, addressed that. Uh, if you're going to offer a book, idea. 
if you offer a book for free, get something for it so it's not free. I want your email address and then you can read my book. So uh, that's not, that's not, that's a different free. It's a, it's a reader magnet. It brings people onto, into your stable so they can see when the next book comes out or any other books in your backlist. So that's a completely different effort. And if you read my uh, book on, I, I have a book on that, uh, Release Strategies, you'll see I address, uh, I talk a lot about uh, Reader Magnet and taking making that first story free. And that first story, it needs to be your best effort. Uh, every story needs to be your best effort. Uh, I used to give a story away for free. That was something, uh, just a jack off that I wrote uh, real quick and uh, it was funny and stuff, but it didn't represent my reading. And I finally got feedback from somebody who's like, oh, man, my writing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, <clears throat> so I finally got feedback from somebody who said, hey, I, I like your other stuff, but I hate this first story because it's not what you're writing. And I'm like, holy shit, you know what? You're right. So I gave a bunch of other short stories away for free. And now that changed it. Now the dynamic of people who unsubscribe right away has changed rather significantly. So they come in and at least they stay on board for one or two newsletters before mm -hmm. they uh, – before they bail, after they see this is what I like, this is what I don't like. So uh, I've had much, much better success with a reader magnet that was more aligned with how I write more uh, uh, Robert Heinlein, uh, Andre Norton kind of uh, readership. Those readers like my stuff and uh, and stay on board. So just to <clears throat> so, um, the whole hashtag probably, we had an interview or we talked with Apple at the New York Book Fair a couple months ago, and he was the individual that we were talking to, he and her, um, they were definitely pushing on Apple that first book free is a good strategy. It's very similar to going to the grocery store. You pick up a little bit of food that they're handing out for free, and then they, you know, you they grab the food. So there, he was suggesting it. Now, whether or not we in the indie community concur is up for debate. It's up for, you know, some people it's going to work, some people it's not going to work. But, you know, what Craig is really saying is, um, the only other reason that you would do it if you're not going to grab the email is to get your name out there because it, the the what I've heard is that on wide, it's going to take you six to nine months to get any traction whatsoever. Yeah. So if your goal is to at least <clears throat> be out there, you know, to be seen, you know, that's a different model than what's on Amazon itself. Amazon, yeah, they have free, they have free charge, they have all of these things. We use it occasionally to push a book for two or three days or a week whenever we have a series behind it because Amazon will also do algorithms to get people, and it's very similar to what's going on, but perpetually free. Um, I know of one individual that started that way back in 2014, 2015, and it worked for a long time, but the last time I spoke to them about it two years ago, it really wasn't working to speak of, not compared to how it used to be. And mind you, it was like every three to 500 books that, that would be given out, they'd get a reader to the second book type of situation. So for what yeah. it's worth. It, yeah, I, uh, uh, perma free and Amazon is no longer by their own terms of service uh, required to price match to free. If you have no books with them and then you want them, uh, want them to promote your book for free and carry it on their distribution, they make no money on that, except for the fact that you might funnel people to their site, except they've got a lot of people funneling people to their site and they'd rather make a few nickels off you. So just understand they don't have to. If you ask nicely, uh, generally they will. But uh, but they don't need to. Um, <clears throat> somebody asked about price. I, my I price all my books at four ninety nine. I think one might still be hanging out there at three ninety nine. But uh, four ninety nine. That's uh, books from thirty five thousand words to one hundred and twenty thousand words are all four ninety nine. Really? And uh, I expect sometime we'll move them up to five ninety nine. Uh, my thirty k or less books are two ninety nine, and that's just hey, it's a novella, so there's no surprise when they look at the page count and say, hey, this is only 107 pages. Yes, and it's only $2.99. Uh, you find a book that's 250 pages, it's four ninety nine. dollars Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, the pricing, and I tell you what, one of my big winners right now is I took my free trader series, which is nine books. It's 2,964 KENP, which they pay you for a max of 3,000 uh, KENP pages uh, under KU. So that one, uh, I priced at nine ninety nine, the max, because it's in KU. Oh no, and, it's not the max. Well, it's it's the max to get seventy percent. Correct. So you have to go up to past nineteen ninety nine, which yeah, there are some other things, but yes, I mean there's a there's strategy right there. You're talking about a box set, effectively, just mm -hmm. so people understand what you're what you're talking about, and you're really going after the KU. We've got some yep. strategies where we're doing that, where we actually price it very cheaply, ninety nine cents. 
But yeah. we also have strategies where we jacked the box set up to 19.99 or more because we don't want people to buy it yeah. at that price. Yeah. Now, and that, there's and that's the 9.99 and I'm spending a lot of money on advertising to get people in and that's it's doing well. It's it's more mm -hmm. than break even for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's there's some some options there. Um, for those who haven't been in the industry, I mean, it seems, I feel like an old man here for three and a half years. That's not really long in the industry, but I've seen the transfer from two ninety nine to three ninety nine. That was very, uh, gut wrenching for me. I thought I was going to lose a lot of fans when I did that. And I did it partially because Amazon did one of their minor jumps on the K E N P where they finagled crap. And all of a sudden I was losing money because, um, probably two thirds of our books got adjusted down and the other third got adjusted up or something. And so I went ahead and pulled it, but uh, Rick Walteria told me, you're not going to see any difference. And I didn't. And so when it was time to go from 399 to 499, because you look at the statistics and the charts from last year in 2018, you'll see that once again, we were starting to go down on 399 and 499 was starting to go up, you know, the pressure. And so I was like, all right, you know, 499 is the new it, there's still a little bit of it, but you know, we pulled it once again, really didn't see any differences between them. And because of that, we've adjusted, um, you know, how we go out. We, we do our pre-orders now. The last couple of them have been at full price, whereas we used to be doing them at a dollar discount. So we do our pre-orders at full price between the day that it actually goes live and the day that we do our special for the fans. We usually drop it to $3.99. We'll do our special for the fans and it goes back to full price. Usually mm -hmm. no more than seven to eight days in between all of that that goes on. But um, and, our and books. Different, differences by genres as well. Yes. Yes. Very like true. Regency Romance, you can get nine ninety nine for for an ebook in Regency Romance. If it's good, you're writing a good book because that is it's a very small market, but it's they're really hungry for that stuff that's good. So. Uh, and other markets, maybe two ninety nine is the most you can get because it's so overwhelmed with with uh, uh, material. Yes, so there's there's all of that, um, but we do we do some strategy related to pricing that would seem obtuse. So never look at some of your competitors without trying to understand what are their context within why are they pricing it that way. Yeah. and it could just yeah. be because they you know they saw somebody else price this way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's it, it, when you look. <clears throat> I'll, I'll see, uh, uh, I'll check my book's ranks every now and then, and I'll see, hey, I'm top 10, and it's nice to see a book at 499, my book at 499, and then the top five are all 99 cents. It's like, okay, hey, good for you, man, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy with my 499 sitting right behind yours selling almost the same number of copies, and that's, and that's when it comes down to the, 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 the true ego stroker is when that paycheck hits your, hits your bank account, and that's, that is what we work for. That's the bottom line. And we're not cheating you? anything. It's just, hey, it's 499. This is it. My marketing campaign all goes to that because of KU. If, pe if people read in KU, a 499 book might only earn a dollar. And that's, uh, uh, we. It, it's still in there. It's still up. It's still the sales. The uh, I, I tell you what, I do like the 999 because that really forced people into, uh, into KU. And nine books for $10 I'm getting a lot of sales. I'm really surprised at the number of sales I'm getting of that uh, of that box set at that price. Mm -hmm. uh, same here. Um, did you happen to pay attention to your, and now we're going slightly off tangent, but how long it took Amazon to get your European money into your account? Oh, I, I was mistaken. I thought I had gotten it on the first. I got it, uh, what, two days ago. I got it on the 10th, I think. Yes, so did we. And it was, I was, I was looking at one thing because we had a bill hit. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I had... I had just assumed, even though I had kind of seen some people going, oh, you know, we don't have our EU. I had kind of assumed I didn't pay attention and I got I, my butt handed to me because I didn't double check that. And it adjusted a few things on the on the cash flow until it showed up. I'm like, what the hell? What was that number? for? Was that uh, like $30,000 in missing payments for you? A little less than that. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it, it, and it's 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 kind of funny because I thought I'm like oh hey there's mine it's there's my my uh, my GBP and uh, I got it I'm like holy shit I made that much I didn't, <laughs> I, I, I didn't even I didn't even realize that uh, I hadn't gotten UK I thought I had because the I number I. I went back and checked and I'm like okay there's that oh there it is 
<clears throat> but uh, it, it wasn't. That was something completely <laughs> different. I don't even know what that other payment was for. That was what I thought the GBP payment was. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it is. But the good news is I now have pounds, like armload of pounds for Edinburgh. Excellent. That is excellent. Yeah, I have payments for something that I was scrambling going, why? What happened? <laughs> Uh, that was embarrassing to myself. I <clears> hopefully <throat> never will do it again, nor will I presume that um, Amazon's just taking care of it. <laughs> and, and and good on the indies for being yes. the ad adults in the room and say, hey, I'm missing my payment. Let me email them. Let me call them. Let me contact them and being respectful and kind and saying, hey, I didn't get my EU payments. And then they addressed it. They collected it. So we're individuals, but the power the power is in the individual through the collective, through all of us together, but still we have to call individually. It's not, hey, Craig Martell knows a guy at Amazon and can call and get it taken care of. No, it took it took thousands of people calling and saying, what the fuck? So <laughs> how many minutes did we make it before you did the F bomb? <laughs> <laughs> I think I already used it once, man. Sorry. Oh, all right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm crushed. I'm, I'm gutted. Uh, you're not. <laughs> Just for the clarification, you're, you're not got it. So we got Edinburgh coming up. Uh, I leave on the 22nd. I think you're leaving next week, but you go to Russia first. I leave on Tuesday. I'm going to Russia. I, I have a meeting uh, on Thursday with uh, uh, one of the top lit RPG authors. Uh, we've invited him to uh, uh, to Vegas. And uh, I, I uh, sent the paperwork for him to get his visa, and hopefully he'll be able to make it. Uh, he was uh, one of the first ones in the industry. He's perennial top 10, uh, uh, Vasily Mahanyenko, and uh, uh, his English is quite good. So we invited him over to the to the hotel for the brunch We're replacing buffet. you. <laughs> We're that? replacing you. We're replacing you. His English is better than yours. Yeah, uh, indubitably. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, in Budapest, Caitlin Mal Malakuti, I'll uh, meet her and hang out. And uh, she's offered to take us around and show us a little bit of Budapest. And then we fly into Edinburgh uh, on the 24th. And uh, we're not going to do dinner that night. Uh, I, I, we just won't be able to. So we'll hang out in the Salisbury, wait for you guys, and uh, and catch something right there. Yeah, so, uh, I'm uh, I'm still exhausted from all the travel, and I can't imagine what it's going to feel like that night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, because I know I need to be over at the hotel, uh, over at the uh, John McIntyre Conference Center by nine, and uh, welcoming people and getting everything uh, uh, going in the right direction. We're not going to have a big mob at nine. Uh, I mean, we might have uh, 50 people or, or 100, but it's not going to be a big mob. It's not like freaking Vegas where uh, we had 500 people line up saying, come on, tickets, man. Give us our tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's a uh, hey, uh, we, we have a new bellwether. We have a new bar to meet the uh, 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 Liberty Con sold mm -hmm. out in 29 minutes. I don't know how many people they have coming at Liberty Con, but we have uh, we sold out of 850 seats in 31 minutes. So, uh, <clears throat> Liberty Con, but isn't, I mean, Liberty Con, is that more of a, a pop culture convention? I don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, that's like uh, San Diego Comic-Con. They'll sell out of 50,000 seats in, in like five uh, minutes. Yeah. A great episode on uh, Big Bang where they're all clicking uh, refresh compulsively. <clears throat> okay. This isn't even remotely close. <laughs> uh, Liberty Con, I mean, at least the one that I'm looking at right now has more to do with, uh, Premier multi-generation gathering of a thousand plus pro-liberty students, activists, and supporters from around the world. That's a different uh, oh, Tennessee's con. yes, Tennessee's literary sci-fi con. Okay, let's try to figure out what this one is then. Um, liberty con number thirty-three. Congratulations for them. Holy moly! Twenty-nine minutes, nineteen seconds. Okay, um, it's, it's somebody posted. It's Bain's home home convention. So oh. Bain Publishing. That's their show. Okay. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I uh, great respect for Bain. I have yeah. great respect for Bain. Good, good, Just, good for them. I, I, and I, I was told I should go to that convention, too, at uh, some point in time. But I, I also heard that they're they're sold out. So. <laughs> Wait a minute. You heard that they sold? You just told everyone they were sold out. <laughs> All right. Back to back to indie authors. Um, the stuff that we're Miss tangent on. lies. Damned yeah. lies. And statistics. <laughs> Oh, wait, that's not what it says. Lies, yeah, damn yeah. lies, statistics is what I've heard all the time. But just, you know, in general, I think that one of the, the encouragements that I would have is that I never 
built my company on listening to everybody else and what they said had to be done. Yeah. I would take it, I would look at it for myself as a reader or a business person and say, you know, how can I make this better? I definitely push the envelope related to how fast something can be produced and can be edited and can go out. And because uh, myself and then the people who support and work with me and the whole teams they have behind them, we can do things few others can. You know, so we uh, we do have the ability to take a book, you know, book one through beta editing, through editing, through JIT and out the door in three weeks. Every other book is scheduled two weeks. So that's not like we look at this and say, all right, um, you can come in November 1st. What we say is, OK, we look at when the uh, author is going to hit it. Now, one thing I think we should bring up is we because of this, if an author doesn't hit their date, guess what moves? it's going to be their publication date, generally speaking, moves because they have an obligation to hit it. And if they don't, that's going to be down on them for the most part. And that date moves, which sucks for them. But we have dozens of books going out a month and they have to understand you got to be an adult. Just the same <clears> rules <throat> that are in 20 books. Be an adult, hit your dates. And if not, I'm not going to say, you know, your life, your health, your family is yeah. more important. Yeah. But the... Uh, one of the things we saw when we posted uh, myths and, and, and those things is people really wanted to vent. And uh, one thing, 20 books is we're, we're here to encourage. So uh, we don't want we don't want you to get down because somebody told you, oh, you write you write your little books, uh, which is a, a demeaning way to say uh, you're, you're an author um, or or any of those things that we've all heard. Oh, you work from home. So you have lots of free time. Oh, fuck. I mean, I work, like <laughs> no, 16 I, don't. Hours a, I work like 16 hours a day for Pete's sake. But it's it's worth it because we're us and this is our tribe. Thirty two thousand three hundred people as of this morning in twenty books to fifty k, and that's uh, even after we booted people who uh, who wanted to go overboard on the myths uh, thing. Um, <laughs> this is got to keep those standards, got to maintain those encouragement. We're here about uh, uh, your business because this is a business you put on your artist hat to write that great book, tell that great story in a great way, and then you take that hat off. You put on your business hat and then you sell your baby. And that's uh, <laughs> once you get around that and and look at it as this. Now, this is a product. And how do I get it in the right hands and the most right hands I can possibly get it into, whether that's free to get them on board and keep them on board, whether that's I'm not even going to advertise until I have the third book. It's, those are all business strategies that we've discussed a lot on 20 books, 50 K registered. The uh, or or in in my book, a successful indie author or release strategies. Both of those I talk about the different methodologies, but it's all it's all a business decision. Put on your business hat and look what it's what's going to work for you. If you can stockpile three books in one series, then that may be better. If you only write standalones, well, that's going to be a completely different marketing strategy, and you're going to have to up your marketing game. Uh, Mark Dawson's SPF ads for authors. That is a great place to find out here's how to advertise. And it goes across all platforms and it's a lifetime thing. So they're closed now. They won't open back up for six months. But that's what you need. You need to up your marketing game if you write standalones. It doesn't mean you can't be successful. It just means you have to focus on that part of the business until such time as you're Robert Heinlein and you're selling your name. Hey, Robert Heinlein has a new book, not there's a new Discworld book. I know a different hey. author, but still. So when is Mark opening SPF again, typically? It's going to be, uh, he said, six months, probably uh, December, November. I December. wonder if we could get him to open it for 72 hours during 20 books. We might. We might. <laughs> I'm like, hmm. in, uh, in, in a few months, SPF 101. Uh, SPF 101 is only uh, $500, still only. It's, it's a fairly uh, decent chunk of change. But that's for newer authors to establish these other things that you need to do that foundation of your business ads for authors is all about selling your baby. I mean, uh, uh, your book. No. Yeah. If it's your baby, that's a different paradigm. So just as a note, um, I generally speaking, don't toot my horn, um, for various and sundry reasons, but with everybody that's helped LMBPN people who've helped me at the moment of 30 seconds ago, uh, I was ranked number nine in the store. Well done, Michael. Well done. And that'll be 13 tomorrow. <laughs> this is sure, sure. 
I, I, I vaulted up to like number 62 in sci-fi uh, over the, over the night. And I was, I was happy with that. Yeah. The, <clears throat> the, uh, all of the us, uh, the rising tide. And that's when Michael brought, came over from K boards and said, I'll, I'll start my own group and we'll just talk about things that are important to me first. And then now all of a sudden it's important to a lot of us. Uh, we do the, those things. Uh, Michael and I both have that philanthropy uh, mm -hmm. gene that says we must give back. Otherwise we feel physical pain. So uh, we will constantly give back, even though it might cost us a little bit, but still we're running our businesses. I, uh, I, I am miffed that I only had a hundred words this morning. I wanted to have a thousand, but I really, I really uh, uh, needed to get out the information. Vegas 2020, get people excited about that. Vegas 2019, those things that are going on. Edinburgh, make sure that we have everything we need in track online for that. I leave Tuesday. So the last of anything I'm going to do for Edinburgh is Monday, you know, just two days from now. And Good then question. when I get there. I think that it's it's relevant that we have a person who says they're going to make a decision to actually reiterate in a public venue this decision over and over again. To be clear, 20, 2020, oh, there's only one 20 books major event, not including plus minus Adelaide. Yeah. And I, I don't even know if we'll do Adelaide in 2020. I know you said you probably wouldn't be back just because you've got somewhere else to go for your New, New Year's Eve celebrations. Yeah. So I, I love so Australia, that, but you people are far to get to. <laughs> that's a, it's, a, it's a long ways down there. And I go, I go there for, uh, for my son and his family. They'll be moving there next summer. So uh, uh, we will spend significant amount of times. Actually, I think I'm thinking about going there next summer here, winter down there, because winter down there is like 60 degrees during the day. So it's like summer here. Um, the uh, uh, because that's when they're moving down and go stay there for a month or, or something like that. Uh, we love Adelaide. We love it there. And my 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 son and his family are there. So if I want to see my grandkids, that's where I got to go. <clears throat> but the. Uh, for 2020, it really is going to come down to one show. Vegas is going to be a headline of 1,500 attendees. Uh, we have a thousand this year. We have 500 on hold uh, on, on the wait list, and we could we could easily probably ha have filled all 1,500 seats and had another 500 on a wait list because we had a lot of people who who bounced in, said, "Oh, it's full," and bounced out, and and we didn't get their emails or anything, and that's okay. It's uh, this is the conference to go to. We have a lot of uh, uh, positive public recognition uh, across the board, across all genres, across all uh, 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 perspectives, whether it's traditionally based. Uh, uh, we are uh, agnostic. Prof professional organizations uh, that uh, look at 20 books because all we're trying to do, we don't take sponsors. We don't take sides. We just want to sell one more book. And it's not us selling books to you. Yes, I sell the nonfiction to you because uh, I wrote, I write the nonfiction for 20 books. That was never my intent to be a nonfiction author. I, I like my fiction. And what I got my hundred words on today was Nightwalker 5, which is a, uh, a thing that we did. It's for uh, Frank Roderus and the Roderus estate. He passed away in 2015. Michael uh, worked through and picked up the license for the four books that were discovered on his computer after he passed away that he had never sold. Through Mike Gray of Wolfpack. But yes. And Mike Bray of Wolfpack, he found them first and and Michael has picked them up. We licensed uh, licensed them and and I've continued writing the series for the Rotorous Estate and for uh, uh, Yes, I Get a Cut too and LMBPN gets a cut. But uh, it's still, it's Frank's series. Frank's name is prominent on the cover and will be on all the covers. Uh, with Craig Martell, and uh, there we are. It's a it's a it's a neat series. I like write, writing post apoc, but that those are the things we're doing. It's a little bit of philanthropy, and it's a it's also it's a an exercise in writing Western style, which I haven't quite got got gotten down yet. Uh, I love westerns. I've been reading. What am I reading nowadays? Uh, Louis L'Amour. Uh, uh, Louis L'Amour. I mean, he is a master storyteller. Yes. I uh, and and he died. A hundred years ago. I mean, his stories <laughs> did were from, not die. I talked he, to his son one time when I was brand new as an author, he, and he I died wanted to seventy-five, something like that. I don't know. I don't. I mean, because I was reading him in junior high, and I don't remember him being dead then. But I, you know, maybe I didn't know the difference between it. But um, I'm pretty sure he wasn't dead back then. Yeah, look it up at the moment. But um, I'm gonna look it up. I'm gonna get Louis L'Amour. I mean, sack it. Wikipedia. We make up was, enough shit. We don't need to make that up. Oh, too. my hard backs were falling apart by the, the last time I remember them. Loving him. William Tell Sackett. Oh. <clears throat> 1908 to 1988. Ha! So there we go. 
He was there born in go. North Dakota. Yeah, yeah, and he has. Uh, let me see how many books he wrote. A lot of books. He has his own category on on Amazon. He should. Otherwise, yeah. he you know he would own a lot of stuff. But you know, westerns. I did cut my teeth back in junior high on westerns. They do have a certain cadence to them, and we are going to be doing something a little bit in the western genre, so to speak. And I'll be talking to Bray about that hopefully later today. Uh, that that Wolfpack Publishing owns westerns for all intents and purposes. They do. <laughs> <clears throat> but that, but the Western style, it's a, it's a really, it's not just Western, it's it's a men's adventure fiction, and it, it's just something. It's a, it's a good genre, and these aren't these aren't misogynistic or anything like that. They're just. Uh, they're I, I just, hope Mike, I hope Mike's not listening to us right now because he'll probably be yelling at his. Stop talking about my Western genre. <laughs> <laughs> Own it, man. Own it. Come on. <clears throat> but but Louis Lamour is 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 a great example of of flowing prose in my mind. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I'm, I'm reading it to study it. Uh, there are other books and stuff that you can read. And uh, I see the little clips. I read differently now as an author, but uh, Louis L'Amour is really, really a joy to read. And uh, I, I like it. Good stories. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. So the done? absolute, absolute musts uh, as a, as an author, I, I, I like to read. Uh, we do know people who write well and, and don't read anything. And Listen, uh, um, it's, if you wanted a good one is Stephen King's on writing. You can, I personally, I listened to it on audio. If mm -hmm. I ever did it again, I'd totally skip his personal part of the stories and just go to his others. I mean, there are definitely things in there. I don't agree with his, he has a, a comment. I don't know if he's ever retracted it or modified it, but there was a comment about, you know, just throw away your first million words. And if I did that, I throw away my first million bucks. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think that's always totally appropriate. But his idea behind that of, you know, throw away your first million words was you're practicing. You know, I didn't I didn't write a whole bunch for most of my adult well, all of my adult life from the standpoint of fiction. So but I had read thousands of books. Yeah. And so kind of through osmosis of just reading them, I <clears> hear the cadence and so I skipped the whole first million words. Yeah, same here. Same here. I went into it, but I've read thousands of books growing up, and that's uh, and 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 tens of thousands of pages of uh, law, case law, uh, going through law school. Which that didn't is, help you. It's different. Here, here's how not to write engaging <laughs> prose. So I have I have tens of thousands of pages of that. <clears throat> it's a, but the the. Uh, uh, the steps, make sure you do the steps as far as who and what and how much you pay for each step is really up to you. Uh, uh, there are still authors who who have their own covers. Why do we say Andy Weir for 2120 or something, 2020 on your board? Oh, because I'd like to have him come uh, to Vegas 2020. Okay. I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> the the uh, what, what I found when I was looking for guest speakers for 2019 mm -hmm. was uh, if you don't ask them at least – well, well more than a year in advance, it's almost impossible to get them. Because like me, I know I know my schedule for next year. I, I, I have some slots now because I'm not running, uh, say, an Edinburgh conference or something like that. But uh, uh, and I'm not going to the Nebs next year. So I've got that uh, that I've got more time. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm more available. But somebody like Andy Weir and a publicist, he's got set things that he's going to go to. But can we get them to Vegas? Can we get uh, uh, other folks? Like I asked Hugh Howie to come to Bali. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he was in South Africa at the time, or he would be during the show. And I asked him a year and a little bit early. And he was still not able to come. I did ask uh, 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 AG, Jerry Riddle, uh, if he would come to Bali. And he said, no, that doesn't work. But man, it sounds like a great time. So those, uh, <clears throat> those kind of, uh, we're working hard. We are working very hard to get the right authors and high, high profile folks to come and see us and talk to you and, and just share what they know. I mean, I, I know Michael has met uh, Jim Butcher, uh, Brandon Sanderson, and uh, and other folks, big names in the industry who uh, who might come. And, uh, and We should and, probably and ask Ronnie to ask Jim Butcher if he'd be willing. <clears throat> Jim was interesting. I uh, met him at, in fact, actually, we could ask Kevin J. Anderson. What am I thinking? Yeah. Um, uh, and Kevin's going to be there this year, isn't he? Or is he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, Kevin's on a bunch of panels and stuff, and and Rebecca as well. Okay, and Rebecca's <clears throat> book—we just released, um, re-released one of Rebecca's book yesterday. It hit one, number one in like uh, steampunk and one of the steampunk areas, so that was a lot of fun. But you know, okay. 
thank you very much, Rebecca Mesta, for trusting LMBPN to republish one of her back or one of her backlist series. That's cool. That's cool. A, a quality people. It goes up every year, but we uh, we still have to ask way early, <clears throat> and that's uh, that's important. Uh, like Kevin J. Anderson, getting him to come to Bali. It, mm-hmm. it was just a fluke that it was, hey, he's like, oh, hey, I just had something drop off. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to get uh, get him. Mm-hmm. And, and Mark Dawson uh, getting on his schedule a good year or more. Uh, yes. <clears throat> year and uh, a half. To... Actually, I think James had to come in and first say, yeah, okay, Mark, you, you can spend the time. Yeah. So so asking – so that's I, – I did make a note. That's a real note as opposed to the James Patterson uh, note. <laughs> And, and and James Patterson, I mean, we know people who live close by and and uh, we would love to have somebody, even if it was remotely. Hey, come say say kind words for 15 minutes to our folks. Uh, we'll project you on the big screen and uh, and, and encourage the authors mm-hmm. uh, as as you get bigger and bigger. Like even J.K. Rowling with Pottermore is about encouraging authors uh, to to write and uh, and not exploit them. <laughs> just uh, just write and get the and, and, and encourage them to keep writing and telling stories because uh, the world revolves around stories. The great escape is a great thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for some people, it actually, uh, one person I saw said, my books are, are paying my electrical bill. So that that's is a what great I, That's thing. what I love to hear. I mean, that is one of the things I think that changes lives, changes things. And maybe that's one of the, if you want to jot it down for the future, one of the things that causes my heart to be happy about 20 books is because it changes even, Hey, I was able to buy Infamil. I was able to buy, you pay my electric bill. I was able to get a car. I was able to change my car. I was able to breathe a little easier. When <clears throat> we encourage people to be able to build a tiny business with, with books and it encourages other people who might be in the hospital, we have done an amazing thing. And that's, and that is the evolved 20 books to 50k changing lives mm-hmm. uh, changing readers lives uh, I, I have one that I kept uh, it was a woman in hospice she says your books are literally keeping me alive because I can't wait for the next one and I'm staying alive because you, you better get that next one out I'm like oh man sense of urgency I better, I better fucking write <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> uh, it, well kind of it's like I don't want to get it too quickly I mean hang on hang on but, uh, <clears throat> But but those kinds of things, changing lives. Is, uh, so that's uh, for t- uh, Vegas 2020. We put uh, from authors to empires, because it's about uh, it's about uh, uh, us as a movement. Little things like uh, Amazon changing their their pre order, so you didn't have to upload a book that could then be missent to everybody, a placeholder. So they don't do that anymore. And improving their dashboard and all of those things from our interaction, our collectively, the indies, not me and Michael. Uh, we're not going to bogar any credit for that. <clears throat> the uh, ask ask Michael what he's wearing underneath his uh, his his uh, jacket. No, we're not going to bogar Michael either. <laughs> what? Whatever I've got mean. my kilt, and my kilt is ready for Edinburgh. And uh, styling it is. I have a nice white. Uh, 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 a uh, Brooks Brothers shirt with a sa- a black satin vest that I'll wear with my uh, Marine Corps tartan kilt with my no, high. Uh, you, but I've got a black shirt. Oh, hi, uh, yeah. Hi, yeah. Jeans. Probably has Jeans. the logo on it. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, I've heard that the Kaylee is energetic was a word used, which means I can't Kaylee. So I will be off to the side cheering people on because I don't want to die and nobody wants to carry the dead guy around for the rest <laughs> of the conference. So, <clears throat> yes, no dead guys. All right, man. Time to wrap it. Indeed. Indeed. We got to go. It's Saturday. You guys have a great, uh, great day. Good luck. I uh, hope you got something out of our, uh, our rambling uh, podcast. It's simply you do what you need to do to climb your mountain yes. and uh, you have a great day. Peace. Later.